Hi everyone, this is Professor Hall, and today we are talking about a princess of Mars. So we've got a couple lectures for you, and the first today is just the brief summary. Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Let's get started. So the book starts with a framing device. Um, I've talked about this in a couple other works. I don't know if I used this term specifically, but a lot of early science fiction um, has a framing device at the beginning because authors didn't really believe that the readers could fully suspend disbelief. So in, because these books are too fantastical for ordinary readers, we have to have something to help mediate between the reader and this extraordinary tale they're about to hear. In some of the proto-science fiction works, like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, um, I cut this out for you <laughs> because um, we were just looking at excerpts. But we had a really slow start to H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, and in a similar way, we have a little bit of a, a framing device here. But again, yeah, not uncommon for books of this era to include a note from the editor. In nonfiction, they're meant to authenticate the story. Interestingly enough, they helped uh, many slave narratives. Books like the, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass had a uh, framing device, a, a nonfiction work that had a note from the editor to try to authenticate it. And here, the author is kind of doing the same thing, but to help the reader be brought into this fictional world. So so we have Burroughs speaking as almost a fictional version of himself, explaining how he came to possess his uncle's story. And in this way, we're moved from the realm of fantasy, um, we're moved from realism to fantasy, kind of um, here I've got a little picture, I forgot I put this in, of Bastion from Never Ending Story. Uh, a kid um, in our world today, at least when the movie took place, and he reads a book and then the book presents the fantasy, right? That's a framing device. But here Edgar Rice Burroughs is, is kind of talking almost as himself, how he came upon this story and why we should believe it. So then we travel to Mars. Um, if you're thinking again about the hero's journey, this call to adventure, our hero, John Carter, is, uh, we see him just after the Civil War has ended. He was a soldier for the South. He's about 30 and he's prospecting for gold in Arizona. Like other later science fantasy stories uh, that use teleportation, astral projection, or flying carpet, Carter does not travel to Mars on a spaceship. Instead, he's fleeing from a group of Native Americans. He hides in a cave and he becomes paralyzed. He breaks the paralysis and sees this red orb of Mars. He's drawn toward it. He blacks out and he wakes up on Mars, which the Martians call Barsoom. Now, you can kind of think of this uh, a little bit like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, right? Being taken away by the tornado um, and brought to this fantastical world. If you saw the presentations about Margaret Cavendish's um, Blazing World or the proto-science fiction work True History by Lucian, a ship born aloft, a woman taken up into a portal um, of the North Pole. Again, this is kind of a common device. So this is crossing the threshold and being called into this adventure. Then our first challenge and trial as John Carter is captured. There are red Martians and there are green Martians on this planet of Barsoom. John Carter is found by green Martians. They have four arms. I love this depiction here. And they pride themselves on being mighty warriors. Carter astounds them by jumping over 100 feet um, because of the differences in gravity. They're impressed, so they capture him and they bring him to Tars Tarkas, who's kind of like the second in command. Um, he's given into the care of Sola, a Martian woman who seems to be the only being of uh, this, this green Martian kind who's capable of kindness. And she sets Woola, who's kind of like a watchdog, to guard Carter. Um, a pony-sized creature, it's kind of frog-like, it has tusks, and, and he says, like, it's ugly, but it turns out to be loyal. Um, and it looks frightening at first, but it becomes his companion and pet.
Oops. Okay, so um, as he goes through more trials, he meets the Tharks. Carter spends time with spends time with Sola, and she helps him to understand a little bit more about the land as well as the Green Martians' history, customs, and language. <clears throat> it's pretty important to note, and I'll talk about this more in my in my next uh, lectures. That um, a lot of this is based on the ideas that people had of evolution at the time. That there are uh, evolutionary changes that that create these two races of Martians. But one day the Tharks plunder an airship, taking its cargo, and they they take prisoner a black haired, copper skinned girl that's a, a red Martian. Uh, really, she's exquisite beauty. Her eyes are filled with hope and she sees Carter. She makes a hand signal that he doesn't understand, but he understands at least that it's meant to call for help. But she's dragged away. Um, she is Deja Thoris, a red Martian princess. She is the princess of Mars, um, of Helium. She claims she was on a scientific mission to fix a problem with the planet's air supply. The Tharks, these bl brutal warriors, don't believe her, or at least they don't care, and they plan on killing her. Now, we talked last time about H.G. Wells' classic, The War of the Worlds, and the way that British um, heroes really at least in Wells' work and in some other works at the time, are pulled along by these forces of fate. Um, in contrast, this is really an American book, that he is a strong, determined man, and that he can overcome these obstacles. It's going to be important. So they're on the run. Um, this highly sexualized <laughs> image of this book. But you can see um, Carter here fighting off the Tharks, these four armed green Martians and trying to save um, here. She is quite pale, but in the book she's red. So Sola is sympathetic to Deja Thoris and feels grief at her plight. Knowing this, Carter plans to escape taking Deja Thoris, Sola, and also Willa the, the um, for lack of a better term, the, the pet companion animal that he's got with him. Whether they're able to escape and where they go and what happens next, you'll have to read for yourself. I really don't want to give away too many spoilers. I just wanted to set up the, the stage and, and give you a little bit of historical background to understand this book better. But um, this isn't just a science fantasy novel. I'm going to talk next time about the su other subgenres in a little bit more depth than we normally do, but it's a space opera. It's a swords and sorcery book. It's a planetary romance. It's got this episodic structure. Um, so there are a lot of adventures ahead. And as you read, look to see whether it follows this hero's journey or not. Um, I, I don't know that he ever fully comes to a place of an abyss as many of our other heroes or um, protagonists do because he really is almost supposed to be this perfect specimen of a, an American man. But um, it's quite an interesting book and I hope you enjoy it. If you do, here are some read-alikes. The Gods of Mars, the next book in the series by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Um, H.G. Wells' Time Machine also uses this idea of evolution to look at what the human race might evolve into and has, again, two separate races, um, one that is kind of warlike and one that is more subservient. C.S. Lewis, um, I've mentioned this before, his Space Trilogy. This is the first of that series, Out of the Silent Planet. Um, Stephen King's Wizard in the Glass is part of the Dark Tower series. This one has a, a little bit more fantasy elements than some of the others, but it's an excellent series. And if we had had time, um, I probably would have chosen one of his works to read with you, but it is like 900 pages long. <laughs> um, I mentioned this book in another, um, uh, another lecture, Stranger in a Strange Land. Here it's a Martian uh, coming to, um, to coming to Earth, but a, a little bit of um, kind of this Superman idea where he has um, some powers and abilities beyond our own, which certainly in this story um, John Carter does. The Martian by Andy Weir, Dune by Frank Herbert, again mixing 
um, soft science with hard science mixing fantasy with science fiction. So, um, yeah, so that is a brief kind of beginning summary of the book A Princess of Mars. And next time we'll talk more about some of the features of the genre that it fits into and, and the genre it kind of helped create. And then later we'll talk about the hard and soft sciences as um, as this book kind of explores some of those ideas. Thanks.